Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so as Neil says, uh, I'm uh, Eric Yateman. I'm uh, head of the EE department here. Uh, unlike uh, most of the short talks you're going to see, which are on a very specific technology, I'm going to uh, talk a bit more broadly, not quite as broadly as the title of my talk implies. I'm going to concentrate on uh, information technology, uh, which is obviously encompasses an awful lot of what uh, my department is all about. You probably think of quantum as being something that's associated with the very small, and uh, uh, indeed, to a certain extent, it is. Uh, my uh, own research field is, is microengineering, so I mostly deal with small things. Uh, but smallness doesn't always imply quantum. So uh, in nature, I mean, you, you, you're familiar with the idea that an ant isn't designed quite the same way uh, as an elephant. That's not because of quantum mechanics. The laws governing those two designs are exactly the same, but at different size scales. The implications are different because the relative magnitudes of forces and so on and so forth um, have different implications at different size scales. But at some point, if you scale ever downwards, you get to a level where uh, actually the physical laws that describe the system are different. Uh, quantum mechanics is always there. It, uh, it's not something that suddenly gets switched on, but its implications uh, tend to get, if you like, averaged out uh, in, uh, in most larger systems. I say most uh, because quantum mechanics is unavoidable for the very small, the sort of atomic and subatomic systems. Uh, but the example that I've shown you here is the difference between the Babbage mechanical computer from the 19th century and uh, a modern transistor. I've just shown individual transistors, uh, which only work, as Neil has already mentioned, uh, because of uh, quantum mechanical laws. And uh, although what you're mostly familiar with in integrated uh, information technology really is associated with the very small, transistors are not always small. Uh, in fact, at one end, they're getting bigger and bigger. You can buy a transistor now that can handle thousands of amps and is so big that it takes a couple of people to lift it. Um, nevertheless, it's entirely governed by quantum mechanics. But this is the kind of thing that you're familiar with. Uh, we have a massive semiconductor industry, uh, which more and more governs almost everything we do in every industry, not just its own industry. Uh, and that is entirely based on the laws of quantum mechanics. And it does involve some very small things. So I pulled up a few kind of um, stock photos to illustrate uh, information, uh, integrated information technology. Uh, this chap here, I noticed when I pulled it up that it didn't have a scale bar. And I was about to add one. And I said, no, actually, it is self-scaling because all this granularity that you see, that's individual atoms. So that immediately gives you an idea. This is uh, state-of-the-art uh, FinFET technology. Um, it says chip works, but this is probably an Intel design. And so these are individual transistors. And the smallest dimensions are on the order of four or five atoms, the kind of size. Um, so that is an established commercial technology, which you can and do go out and buy uh, to power things, as, as Neil mentioned, like uh, the processing in your mobile phone. Okay. But what's changing now is that rather than just uh, quantum mechanics being and quantum physics being associated with the functioning of the devices that process information, now we're actually starting to represent information in the quantum domain in real devices and real systems that are starting to find their way into commercial applications. Again, some sort of stock pictures here. Um, and you're going to hear something specific about that uh, from Mario, I think, either directly after me or shortly. Uh, but some areas of work in our department associated with this uh, include uh, information theory. So information theory is a kind of cornerstone of uh, a large part of uh, communication engineering. Uh, and uh, it probably, as a, as a sort of formal topic, dates from the 1930s or 40s. We have our, our one Nobel Prize winner, uh, alumnus, well, uh, the late uh, Dennis Gabor, uh, who got the Nobel Prize in 1971 and says there for holography. But he, was, uh, he also has some uh, very well-known work in information theory and indeed, a good 40, 50 years ago, was pioneering uh, the extension of information theory into the quantum domain. So information theory basically defines what the maximum amount of, of information you can represent and communicate and transmit in a particular system with particular constraints. And uh, following on from the legacy of 
Dennis Gabor, we have a quite uh, major activity in, in what you might call classical information theory in the department, quite a number of people working on that. Uh, and one of my colleagues, uh, Kong Ling, is starting to extend that work now into quantum information uh, aspects. So why might that be important? Well, uh, we're starting to see, uh, as you will have heard, quantum computing capabilities starting to become real. And one of the things that uh, quantum computing is very good at is doing particular kinds of calculations uh, because of a, an effective large degree of simultaneity, simultaneity very, very fast. And, and one of those applications is to break codes. So this uh, results in, I think, two implications for people working on true information systems. Uh, one is how can we use, in practice, these capabilities of quantum systems to make new and better uh, coding and cryptography systems. And the other, of course, is what should we do with classical systems to limit the, the speed at which they will be broken by these new quantum capabilities. So Kong is looking at, for example, uh, lattice coding, which is a particular kind of coding and cryptography, uh, which is at least a candidate for something that may be able to resist being broken, uh, existing in the classical domain, but resisting being broken by, um, by quantum methods. And the other, of course, is the extension of, 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 of lattice approaches and other approaches into uh, the quantum world directly. Uh, we're starting to get to the capabilities now that if we really are going to implement these systems widely in, in a commercial domain, then we've got to incorporate all these practicalities like how do you choose codes, um, how do you assess the, the power and security of codes, uh, and the capacity of codes to represent large amounts of information. If we go to the next level up, uh, it's not just about representing of information, of course. If you're going to transmit information, then you have to look at networks. And we have uh, large activities, as you would expect, in communication theory and, uh, and networks, particularly wireless networks, which are uh, developing uh, very rapidly these days. And wireless networks also have limitations. They have limitations on the amount of information uh, that can be transmitted uh, given constraints uh, and on security uh, and um, on the uh, error rates and other performance requirements of, of, of networks. And so uh, as we try to squeeze more and more out of the network and uh, as consumers you're familiar with, as we've moved from 2G, 3G, 4G and and now soon into 5G, we seem to be managing to get uh, data rates that on the face of it look like they're almost breaking information theoretic laws. Of course, they're not, but the tricks that we're using to get around fundamental limits like space coding and so on are really getting very sophisticated. The next level is likely to have to take into account and indeed take advantage of the uh, new capabilities that quantum approaches can bring. So, uh, one of the things we're doing in our, in our communication networks. It's a bit like coding, it sort of works in both directions. So we uh, want to look at how quantum methods can be implemented as actual quantum communication networks, but we can also look at how uh, insights and capabilities from quantum can be adapted back into classical networks in order to uh, improve their capabilities and indeed that's one of the things that's being looked at for 5G and, and beyond uh, network capabilities. So that's to do with algorithms, things like multi-antenna processing. Um, if we're going to have quantum encryption, we have to think of practical methods to distribute keys for quantum information theory. And these all have to attach to um, classical uh, networks and classical technology if they're really going to be practical. There'll be a few bespoke applications, maybe in a secure point-to-point -point link for a bank uh, where you might build a standalone quantum system. But apart from that, uh, almost everything we do in quantum is going to be attached to classical systems. And we have to figure out what those interfaces are and how to divide the work between the classical and the quantum approaches. So that's just a kind of very light um, look at what some of the uh, topics and the implications might be of quantum in, in information. So some trends in general, I would say we have a number of devices coming in that are exploiting quantum phenomena, like the Maser you just saw about, and those are becoming more prevalent. As some, if you like, classical devices are becoming more and more capable, then we're starting to see quantum effects that were pre 
previously insignificant becoming significant, and I think uh, my colleague Tom Pike is going to say a little bit about that in, in a few moments. We have uh, quantum becoming more and more part of systems research, and that means bringing in people who deal with systems research, like uh, network systems, communication systems, uh, control systems and, and instrumentation, and uh, we have a lot of experts uh, from those uh, classical domains uh, getting interested in applying their methods and their uh, expertise to quantum systems. Uh, and uh, I think what we're seeking, and you'll start to see some developments in this area, is stronger links between uh, people whose expertise is quantum and people who are domain experts in, for example, particular kinds of measurement systems and particular kinds of uh, commercial devices. So this is probably just more of a plug for the college, but uh, just to say we have uh, very extensive capabilities in, uh, as well as in quantum technology as in areas that are relevant to quantum technology, some of which I mentioned, like control theory. Uh, clearly, quantum information systems are going to need all the software things that classical systems do. They're going to need programmers, they're going to need algorithms, they're going to need software systems. And so we have staff in those areas beginning to apply their skills to quantum. Uh, and also we have some experience of commercialization, particularly in sensor systems, uh, which I think was going to be a benefit as we try to push these quantum methods into the market. Um, and a lot of relevant capabilities in fabrication and test, which you've already seen some examples of a moment ago. Thanks, Eric. Any questions?